This is going to be 1 Timothy chapter 4. And we're going to look at the subject of the latter days. In 1 Timothy 4 and verse 1, it says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter time some should depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, meaning in terms of plainly, it's speaking plainly. And that's what people don't get. They don't get the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't only talk to geniuses and big shots and educated people. It speaks plainly where everyone can understand it. And the only requirement to understand Him is to be saved. Because 1 Timothy 2.14 says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. The only requirement to know what the Holy Spirit says is to be a born-again Christian. John 16, 13 says, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter time some should depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now notice that phrase, latter times. So this is the latter days. We're going to talk about the times we're in today. The last days of the church age is what we're going to talk about. And talk about the latter days that is, D-A-Z-E, days. Because men in this time are dazed. They're dazed and confused. So number one, why are men in a daze in the last days? Is because of seducing spirits. In 2 Timothy 3.13 it says, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Spirits can seduce you by putting enticing thoughts in your head to draw you away from the truth. Preachers are many times led by seducing spirits or lying spirits, as it says in Second Chronicles 18.22. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of these thy prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil against thee. So, now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some should depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So these seducing spirits lead men to teach doctrines of devils. And this is why you need to familiarize yourself with the right doctrine. Spend more time studying right doctrine than you do false doctrine. Revelation 2, 14 through 15 talks about the doctrine of the Nicolaitans and the doctrine of Balaam and the church of, church of Thyatira was allowing the doctrine of Jezebel. So there are doctrines of devils, but then there is also sound doctrine. In 2 Timothy 4, 3 it says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. So the devil knows sound doctrine better than any Bible teacher you know but they seduce men to teach contrary of it. And this is why you have men who don't believe that Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. This is why you have men who teach a baptismal regeneration. You have seducing spirits working in churches. You have them working in Hollywood and the music industry and in sex trafficking. In any field, you have men giving heed to seducing spirits. And here in the latter days, men are in a latter days. They are dazed and confused. Now, number two, they are speaking lies. First Timothy 4, 2, it says, Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Who are some of the biggest hypocrites speaking lies? A man who has a King James Bible, professes to believe it, when he obviously doesn't believe it. I've heard men get up and say the King James Bible is the inspired and preserved words of God and that, that it's without error. But then when he sees something in it that doesn't match his doctrine, 
he'll change the verse. I've sit right in front of a man who said the King James Bible is perfect, and two sentences, two sentences later, he showed where the Schofield corrected the King James in the notes and then agreed with it. Uh, that doesn't make sense. You either believe the Bible or you don't believe the Bible. Is he in a daze? Is he in the latter days? Is he a, a part of the apostasy that's going on? Galatians 2.8 or Colossians 2.8 says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So, I'm a Bible believer before I'm a Baptist. And when Baptist beliefs cross the Bible, I'll take the Bible every time. Just because great Baptist preachers always believe something doesn't mean you should follow it if it isn't in the Bible. But some Baptists will hold on to a Baptist belief even when they've been shown that it crosses the Bible. And Mark 7, 9 says, And he said unto them, Full well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. I'd rather have Bible over tradition. But men have a latter days. They are led by seducing spirits to speak lies. And they are also sexually immoral. In verse 3 of 1 Timothy 4, it says, Forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. So when you hear this doctrine of a devil, this doctrine which forbids someone to marry, what cult do you think of? You think of Catholicism. So they forbid the priest to marry. Therefore, he is going to be sexually immoral. Uh, sexual immorality is strong in the latter days. Uh, pornography, sex trafficking, celibate priests, raping little boys and fornicating with nuns that you hear about all the time, they are sexually immoral. And it's God's plan for most everyone to get married. It's not God's plan for someone to teach that you shouldn't get married. 1 Corinthians 7, 2 says, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Verse 9 of 1 Corinthians 7 says, But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. It's better to marry than to burn in your lust. Mark 10, 6 through 7, But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. So it's God's plan for most everyone to get married. And it's better to marry than to burn in your lust. So you have a lot of Baptist uh, preachers who also forbid to marry. For example, if a young man who's like 20-something years old gets married and his wife leaves him, they teach that the young man must remain unmarried until his wife dies. This is complete nonsense. So did they, de they deceive the young man into thinking he has to burn in his lust until his wife dies. Or if he doesn't, then he's going to be committing adultery by getting remarried. But that is a puffed up pastor. And he said, that same pastor says you just have to make it day by day. And he tried to sound all spiritual when he said it. And quoted Matthew 6.34 which says, Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. He said, If you can be single today, then remember you can be single tomorrow, and then you can be single the next day. And that's easy for him to say, because he still has a wife. He isn't a 21-year-old man burning in his lust because his wife left him. The puffed-up pastor is a, is a Pharisee, Matthew 23, 4 says, referring to the Pharisees, For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. So not only is he a Pharisee, but he can't do basic math. He said the man must remain single, acknowledging that his first wife divorced him, while at the same time teaches that if the young man gets remarried, he teaches he then has two living wives. If you're single and get remarried, you'd have one wife, not two. But if a man desires a woman, 
It's God's plan for him to get married, and he needs to find a wife. He can't find a wife. If he can't find a wife, then he needs to pray for a wife. You have to pray, and then you have to look. You have to put action to your prayers. But this thing of forbidding to marry, like, you know, the Catholics do and many Baptists do in a little bit of a different way, leads to sexual immorality. But that is the latter days. Sexual sins fogs your mind. Sexual sins are seen as the unpardonable sins many times among Baptists. And you have a bunch of Baptists who believe sodomites and other sex perverts can't be saved, which is a, another crazy doctrine because the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse from all sin. The pornography is fogging everyone's mind up. The way women dress is putting people in our latter days because they dress immodestly. So you have this sexual sin going on, keeping everyone in the days. And then in verse 3 it says, Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. So not only do they forbid to marry, but they command to abstain from meats. And if you don't want to eat meat, then that's fine, but you can't command people to abstain from meats or teach it that it's a sin to eat it. Because the next verse says, the next two verses say, For every creature of God is good, and nothing to be refused, if it be received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. So if you can pray over what you're about to eat, then you can eat it. If you can thank the Lord for what you're about to eat, then go ahead and eat it. Now verse 6, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith, and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. Put the brethren in remembrance, because repetition is key. Tell them over and over again. But next in these latter days, you don't just have, you know, sexually immoral. You also have social media slaves. In verse 7 it says, But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. So I say social media slaves because people into this bodily exercise today are constantly putting workout pictures on social media. Whereas this verse says bodily exercise profiteth little, to them, it profits a whole lot in their mind. You have all these guys doing steroids and going to the gym every day, and the whole time they are staring at themselves in the mirror, and then they get out their phone to post selfies on Facebook and Instagram, trying their hardest to get a new picture to impress people on social media. And they become slaves to this type of thing. In the last days, people are in a latter days. They are engulfed in themselves. And 2 Timothy 3, 2 says, For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Bodily exercise just many times is used to help girls be able to make, make a man lust after their bodies more than they already do. You have women who go to the gym with their tight workout pants on to accentuate only the parts of them that their husbands should, should see. And then they work out those certain parts in their routine to accentuate those parts even more. Bodily exercise profiteth little unless it will help you exercise godliness. In verse 7 it says, But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Do some Bible workouts. Work out your mind. Memorize scripture. Read the Bible. Do something for the Lord. But verse 8, for bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. So godliness is profitable now because he that liveth for the flesh shall die. If you're not godly, you can go ahead and get yourself into an early grave. And it's profitable in the life which is to come, godliness that is, because that is where you will be for eternity with rewards or with the loss of rewards 
bodily exercise is only profitable now. And then when you get to a certain age, you aren't going to be able to bench press what you did when you were 20. Proverbs 20 and 29 says, The glory of young men is in their strength, and the beauty of old men is the gray head. Bodily exercise is good. It profits little. It does profit. But godliness is more profitable. Now verse 9 and 10 says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Paul suffered reproach. If you're a Christian who is living like a Christian, you're, you're going to eventually suffer. 1 Peter 3.17 says, For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. You can also suffer for evil. That is what is happening to men in the latter days. Men and women are addicting themselves to pain pills and then suffering through life, waiting to get their next pill and then going through withdrawals when they don't get it. They will drink till they're an alcoholic. They'll smoke pot and do drugs until it ruins their life and their whole family. Proverbs thirteen fifteen says, The way of transgressors is hard. They're in a daze because they aren't even in their right mind most of the time. The devil gets everything by them. He seduced, deceived, beguiles, and tricks them every day of their life. Verse 10 says, For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. But Jesus Christ is the Savior of all men. If you're lost, he is still your Savior. You are just in rejection of his payment. He is the Savior of all men. Calvinists have it wrong. They think he is only the Savior of some men. But the opportunity has presented itself to every man to believe the gospel. But sadly, most men are going to reject the clear gospel. But every dope-headed heathen in the latter days, that's in the latter days, can come and be saved. They can come to Jesus Christ for salvation. But here in these latter days, people are in the latter days because they're sexually immoral. They're social media slaves. And next, they struggle with authority. In verse 11, it says, These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word and conversation and charity and spirit in faith and purity. Paul said these things command and teach. If you have ever been around someone in the latter days, then you probably realize they hate authority. They want to be their own final authority. They want to be their own God. They would struggle going to a church where the pastor would command and teach because they struggle with authority. 2 Timothy 4.2 says, Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. They hate being reproved and rebuke, rebuked. And if you train them at work, they end up training you because they are they're know-it-alls. They see training as bossing, and they won't have you bossing them. In the latter days, men think you couldn't possibly know more than them on any subject. They'll think they know more Bible than you even, though you're 50 years older, I've read the Bible a hundred times, and they've never even read it. They're just newly saved. They'll approach an older man and who's maybe 70 years old, and they'll think, well, I know more Bible than he knows. But Paul tells Timothy to command and teach. And in the last chapter, Paul said to the pastor, Paul said the pastor should be apt to teach. In the last chapter, we studied in 1 Timothy 3. And teaching is a big part of pastoring because this is how the people grow getting in the Bible and digging in the Bible. That's how you can grow as a Christian. Now, 1 Timothy 4.12 says, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word and conversation and charity and spirit and faith and purity. It's never okay to sow your wild oats. People say, Well, that woman wouldn't have ran off with another man if she had sowed her wild oats when she was younger. That's very stupid and a very unbiblical way of thinking. When you're young 
It says, Be thou an example of the believers. Live right when you're young. Live right when you're old. Ecclesiastes 11.9 says, Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth. And walk in the ways of thine heart, and in the sight of thine eyes. But know thou, that for all these things, God will bring thee into judgment. Ecclesiastes 12.1 Remember now thy Creator, in the days of thy youth. While the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. So, people are in this latter days, and the youth are being brought up on Little Nas X and Ariana Grande and Netflix and Hulu. I mean, it's a pretty tough time for people being brought up on that kind of stuff. But it says in verse 12, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word and conversation, in charity and spirit and faith and purity. So in the latter days, they aren't being an example in word or conversation. Young Christian people aren't doing that. Everything that comes out of their mouth and what they do with their actions is childish and is contrary to that verse. Paul talks about when you become a man to put away childish things, but even the grandparents of this generation are childish. But you should go against the grain and be a man, be an example in word and conversation. And when a man preaches, he should preach the word. He gets in trouble when he doesn't preach the word. Many times you hear preachers, and there isn't much word being preached. But you need to be an example in conversation. This has to do with the way you live your life. If you talk the talk when it comes to being a Christian, then you also need to live it. You need to walk it. Be an example in charity. If you know the whole Bible and know all the mysteries and yet don't have charity, charity, then it profits you nothing. People don't care about how much you know. Other Bible-believing Christians might get impressed with how much you know, but the average man on the street cares absolutely nothing about how much you know. They're concerned with how you treat them. Do you love them and do you care about them? That's what they're concerned about. But next, in these latter days, people don't just struggle with sexual immorality and with authority and seducing spirits. They also serve the gods of entertainment. 1 Timothy 4.13 says, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. In the latter days, they don't give attendance to anything but an iPhone and an iPad and a Kindle and Facebook and Instagram and Hulu and Netflix and an Apple MacBook and Beats headphones and AirPods and the NBA and the NFL and the MLB. But Paul says, give attendance to reading. Every Christian should know some things, and you learn by reading. The Bible says, Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. Jesus always asked the question, Have ye not read? Every Christian should be a daily Bible reader. If a minister is going to be apt to teach, he must read. He must read the Bible, read books about the Bible, read about other religions and cults so you can know what they believe and teach against it. But there are so many good Christian authors. Give attendance to reading, to exhortation. When you exhort, you are trying to encourage someone to do something. Give attendance to reading, to doctrine, to exhortation. But most Christians don't know doctrine. They know they believe a few things, but just don't know why they believe it, other than that's what their grandparents and their parents taught them. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Doctrine is how men get interested in the Bible. If you want a bunch of Bible-believing men who constantly read and are more obsessed with the Bible, you have got to get them turned on to doctrine. Women get into the emotional aspect, but men get into the doctrines. And... Things like prophecy and typology and salvation doctrines and verse-by-verse studies that are meaty. There are so many milky ministries, and Christians are starving for the word and don't even know it. The ones who do know end up getting bored. But notice the big-name Baptist preachers are milk ministries today. There isn't hardly any of them that get in the book and dig. 
they do like maybe a phrase from a verse and then you can close the book and they never come back to it again and many times that's but that's all right and entertaining but when it comes right down to it he needs to give something from the bible i don't see anything wrong with making someone open the bible and do some page turning or mentioning other verses as they're preaching but when a preacher gets up and uses a lot of bible it's powerful because the power is in the words but to do that he has to give attendance to reading and to doctrine it makes it a little bit harder a good reason why nobody in churches knows anything is because the pastor doesn't teach them and doesn't encourage them to get in the book at home it's almost as if christians have forgotten the bible even exists and the only time they even read it is at church and it seems as if going to church is the only thing a Christian has to do in these latter days. They never really mention anything else. If someone isn't right with God, they say, you need to get in church, and that's all they say. But that won't be enough. He has to get in the book. Your personal time on your own is much more important because you're out of church more than you're in church. 1 Timothy 4.14 says, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. The presbytery is the elders in the church. When a man is going to be a pastor or deacon, these uh, other pastors and deacons will lay their hands on the man. And it says, Neglect not the gift that is in each person has a certain gift, not speaking in tongues and, and healing and casting out devils and things like that. It's like gifts of teaching, preaching, exhorting. So neglect not the gift. You have to practice your gift. And 1 Timothy 4.15 says, Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. So, but in these latter days, you have people who only meditate because they're doing yoga. They're not meditating on the word. But meditating is a Bible word, but you meditate on the word. Psalms 1 2 says, But my delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Now, verse 16, it says, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. So take heed unto thyself and to the doctrine. Keep yourself in check. Keep your doctrine in check. Don't be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. If you do these things as a minister, you not only save yourself, but also them that hear you. And in the latter days, you need to be leading people right, especially in these times. It's easy to get a hold of seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, but you'll save yourself if you stay away from these things. Save yourself when it comes to your ministry, that is. You'll save others when it comes to them continuing to live for God. And you can make a mess of everything if you're not careful and have someone quit because you're not taking heed unto yourself and unto the doctrine. But this has been First Timothy chapter 4.